I humble pranams at the lotus feet of our beloved Bhagavan, respected director, sir, uh, respected chairpersons, Dr. Neela, madam, uh, esteemed faculty, my loving Sai Rams to you all. It's a great uh, pleasure to uh, be here and to talk to you about uh, what we do from the non-invasive imaging side, that is the echocardiographic evaluation of the mitral valve. And as I was putting this uh, talk together, uh, you know, I was thinking, first I have no disclosures, but as I was putting this talk together, I was thinking, when it comes to the mitral valve by echo, there are at least some 50 odd parameters that we use to describe the mitral valve, the valve severity, the valve anatomy, and importantly for this audience, those echocardiographic parameters that predict successful repair or not. So that's a lot of things. So then I thought, I'm not going to talk to you about all 50 of these parameters. I really have to choose what is most important. So I look to our founder, and he gives a very simple statement that I've been following for a number of years. He says, first, be clear and then everything will follow automatically. You know, I wish I learned this when I was like 15 years old or something. My life would have been much easier. But first, be clear. Because we lack this clarity, we tend to go off this way and that way. So I thought, let me be clear about what would be important for, for this audience. And this, so what I thought is, let me put it in our you know, modern internet terminology. Four things the echo must tell you. First, you need to know the grading of MR severity. Second is you need to know the etiology of MR, and that not only includes the Carpentier classification that you just heard, but also the more uh, distinctive etiologic classification. The mitral valve anatomy, and I like Dr. Mohanty's description of doing the segmental analysis of the uh, mitral valve. And then finally, any associated pathologies such as LV size, LV function, uh, what is the LA size like, are there any uh, associated valvular pathologies, left atrial appendage, thrombus, and so forth. So let's start with the first of these. Let's look at grading of mitral regurgitation severity to see what we need to understand from this. If you look at an MR jet by echo, there are several different components. We can actually break it down. First you have this area of, uh, this is a apical four chamber view, so LV and LA here. So the first you have this area of proximal flow convergence. That's where the blood is getting ready to come in uh, through, the, uh, through the regression orifice. Then you have that narrowed orifice, which is like the vena contracta. And finally you have the regression volume and then the downstream effects. I come from Bangalore, so if you imagine this in Bangalore terms, this would be like Bangalore roads. This would be all the traffic trying to get into this narrow orifice and then finally we get out and then we go this way. That way. So that's what mitral regurgitation is like. So when we quantify mitral regurgitation, then all of these three things can be used to, to uh, give you the grading. Is it 1 plus, 2 plus, or if you want mild, moderate, or severe, and so forth. Now, we can uh, do all sorts of things when, when uh, sorry, when we can do all sorts of things when we look at a, a particular type of valve. So here's an example of uh, the apical trans thoracic apical four chamber view. And if we start with this video, you see that there's some, this is bile regurgitation. We can see a regurgitant jet here, and another one is shown here. And then if we do 3D echo, we can actually slice this in different settings to show it across uh, in, in uh, different formats. So what do we need to know from a mitral regurgitation severity standpoint is first is how bad is the MR? And like I said, there's, you can either use one, two, three plus, or three to four plus, or you can say mild, moderate, severe, moderately severe, and so forth. But remember that there's, there's severe MR, and then there's severe MR with the, where the regurgitant volume is quite high. By echo, we use all of these things that I just described on the previous slides, and that turn, translates into terms like vena contracta, effective regurgitant orifice area, and so forth. These all have these pluses and minuses, their strengths and, and weaknesses, and they're used in different places. But I think there's one point that uh, I really want to emphasize, and that's shown here, is that, yeah, if you have uh, um, ischemic mitral regurgitation, the grading system is entirely different. Ischemic MR means, as you know, that the valves themselves are functionally normal, but that there is an issue uh, with the supporting structures of the valve. And so this is a slide that shows you how we grade MR severity and using all of these different parameters. And they're all useful in their own way in different types of diseases. But with ischemic MR, you have all the different Carpentier classifications. You can, rather. So you can get annual dilatation. In acute cases, you can get papillary and ruptured a papillary muscle rupture, chordate, uh, tendinate rupture. Papillary muscles can get elongated. You can get displacement of the papillary muscle, especially with posterior infarction, et cetera, et cetera. But what this translates to, uh, and the reason why this is important, is because all of the quantification criteria that we use for MR severity is totally different. In fact, it's reduced by half. 
So what, what uh, you need to un understand and remind your cardiologist that if it's ischemic MR, all of the quantification is, is half. So if I, have, if I use the same grading criteria that I'd use for non-ischemic MR, I would actually underestimate my severity of ischemic mitral regurgitation. A classic example of a patient has ischemic MR, the echo report says it's severe mitral regurgitation, but then a, ref a referring cardiologist listens to the patient and says, you know, I don't hear any murmur. And that's because it's not a leaflet disorder. It's a disorder beneath, below the mitral valve leaflets. And again, the grading is completely different. So this is a point that uh, I think is often being missed. It's probably more appreciated nowadays, but it's, again, it's important to remember that. The grading is totally different. Other things that you need to know is that there are a lot of things that affect MR severity as we grade them. Things like higher blood pressure will increase your MR severity grading, and the opposite is also true. And obviously, if you have aortic stenosis or even to some degree aortic regurgitation, that will increase your MR severity as well. So briefly, how to grade MR severity, and then once you know that, then you need to say what's causing the mitral regurgitation? What's the etiology of this? And there are a lot of things. These are some slides that I got from one of our cardiology residents. You have inflammatory etiologies like rheumatic heart disease. We, te we see boatloads of this here in our country. You have uh, degenerative mitral regurgitation, maybe because of myxomatous degeneration, uh, bar lows. This is what we see in uh, Western countries. So when I was at the Cleveland Clinic, we would see a lot of uh, bar lows disease in that, you know, men in their 40 to 50 year old or fibroelastic degeneration in the 60 plus age, who, age range. And these are all things that I think for the uh, students in the audience, these are things that you could be asked on for uh, your examination. Infective endocarditis, of course, is a classic cause of structural diseases like disorders of the chordae, tendinae, papillae muscles, and so forth. And then uh, congenital disorders like cleft mitral leaflets and various types of disorders that they're associated with. That's chronic MR. And then, of course, there's acute MR. And, and basically, this, this involves disorders of the annulus, leaflets, and the various structures of the mitral valve. So there's a whole lot of etiologies. And as we look at the echo, we can often identify what's the exact cause. And obviously, we take the, the history into account. Another thing that if you do 3D MR, you can actually distinguish functional versus organic MR. Organic would be what we call primary MR. This is more of a European terminology here. So primary MR for organic and then secondary or functional MR. So typically, if you look at the orifice right in cross section, it looks like an O, O for organic. And then if you look at it uh, by cross section, if it's elliptical, then it's typically more functional mitral regurgitation. So it's easy to distinguish this. We tell you about the annulus, the annular diameters, and obviously we measured in two different views, the long and short major and minor diameters. And then we tell you about mitral annular calcification, which is also important. And for the cardiologists in the audience, remember that we measured this at end systole. So having said this, we've told you how bad the mitral regurgitation is. We've told you uh, what the likely etiology is. Then we need to look at how likely are we to actually successfully repair the, the valve based on the echo parameters. And there's a whole lot of things. This is a very busy slide. This is a, um, from one of our cardiology textbooks, Braunwald's. And it basically breaks up into etiology and the probability of repair. And so if you have degenerative MR with localized prolapse, P2 being easier than A2, et cetera, uh, with just mild or moderate annular dilatation, then usually repair is quite feasible. And the same for ischemic or functional MR, depending on the Carpentier classification. Barlow's, especially when you have three or more scallops involved, and this is where the echo, I think, really plays a big role, is how many scallops are involved, what particular parts of the, the, the scallops are involved. Especially with moderate annular dilatation, it gets more difficult. Same thing with rheumatic, and then as the barlow's extends, uh, again, it becomes more difficult. As the valves, obviously, you know this, as the leaflets get destroyed by various other diseases like endocarditis and et cetera, then it becomes more difficult. So let me switch gears here, and uh, let me show you the actual leaflets from an echocardiographic picture. So I'm going to show you some an actual T images that we recorded in the OT because it's important that we understand what you're actually seeing when in the OT. And uh, I think it's interesting that uh, in the recent DNB uh, examinations on the theory exam, one of the question was describe the echocardiographic evaluation of echocardiographic anatomy of the mitral valve. So that you were expected to say on the mid-esophageal zero degree view, you're seeing the A2. This is the uh, mid-esophageal two chamber, mid-esophageal four 
four chamber view, right? So this is zero degrees. We've just put the probe in the heart. You can see that the patient is a bit tachycardic, so I'm going to slow down the images to make it easier to see. And then when we focus on the mitral valve, you can see on the color display that there's quite a bit of mitral regurgitation. Seems like there's more than one jet, maybe. And this is the A2 scallop and the P2. So from zero degrees left to right, A2, P2. A little bit of A1, yes, a little bit of P1, but primarily this. Now if I take the probe out to the mid-esophageal five-chamber view where the, the LVOT is seen, then I'm seeing A1 and P1. So again, let me just reduce the speed. A1 here and P1 there. And then if I push in with the probe, so now I'm a lower esophageal view, I'm seeing A3 and P3. So from this mid-esophageal view, just based on how we adjust the probe, you can actually see all the different scallops. But there's another view that's very important, that's called the bicomishural view, and that's shown in this next image here. Here's your degree. So this is your 60 degree view. This is your left atrial appendage and your LCX here. And so what we're seeing here, you can see all of the scallops of the mitral valve. We don't use this for grading the MR severity, but we use it for telling you where the MR is coming from. So here we're seeing P1 scallop, and this little indentation here, I'll just reduce the speed again, is A2, and then this is P3. So you have A1, sorry, P1, sorry, P1, next to this LA appendage, A2, and then P3. Now, if I just rotate the probe a little bit clockwise, then I see all of the anterior scallops. So now I have A1, A2, A3, and then if I rotate a little bit more anti-clockwise, I can see the posterior scallop. So I have P1, P2, P3, and here you can clearly see that this P3 scallop is, uh, is prolapsing, and you can see the etiology of the mitral regurgitation here. So this is how we would do this, and we would tell the surgeon where the etiology is, where the valve is, uh, uh, where the disease is coming from, what scallops are involved, how many scallops are involved. We would make our dimensions, uh, our measurements of annular diameter. We'd make all these other fancy measurements that we do and so forth. So that's, that's what we do. And finally, the 120 degree view, the long axis view is shown here, and this is showing, I'll just remove the uh, color. This is one, two, three. So this is A1, A2, and then P3. So A1, A2, P3. That's a lot. No? So you've got, I think, a zero degree view, a 60 degree view, a 90 degree view, and a 120 degree. That's four. And then you have a short axis view if you go into the stomach. That's five. So it gets very complicated. And surgeons really don't have the time or the interest to see all of these things. So what we do when we, when we, when we have the possibility is we do a 3D TE. And that's what's being shown here. This is the images you just now saw. And so it's much easier here. This is A1, A2, A3. This is your aortic valve. This is your uh, left and right fibrous trigones, your left atrial appendage sits here, and then this is P1, P2, and P3. So where's the regurgitation? Where's the scallop prolapsing here? P3, right? That's this thing coming out here. So that's coming back to you. That's, uh, that's the P3 scallop. So you can just see it's isolated P3 uh, prolapse, and that this would be feasible. We would measure the annulus, and we tell you that it's quite feasible for uh, repair. So we can use T very well to tell you what's happening, but we have to put it into context of all the other variables that we measure. So yeah, we look at things like uh, the annulus, the, the chordae, the papillary muscles, and so forth. And there's some new things that have also come out, and that's what's shown on this slide. For functional mitral regurgitation, there are some newer, newer measurements that have come out. There's six of them shown here, but actually there's probably just a few that are really useful. One is this coaptation height. See this measurement here? This is a parasternal long axis view. I just measure A, B, and then C. So I go just measure the annulus, then I measure the height from this annulus to the tip of this line. And if this is more than 10 millimeters, the chance of successful repair is less. Okay? So in the same way, I can measure this area. This is basically the same measurement. Instead of measuring this height, I'm just measuring this area. And if this is more than two and a half square centimeters, again, the chance of successful repair is very, very less. That means basically this, uh, this, these leaflets are being retracted down farther away from the mitral of the annulus, and repair becomes more difficult. There are these other things here, too. Sometimes we'll look at interpapillary muscle distance, especially with ischemic MR. But if you just remember these two things, then it's actually very useful to quantify uh, mitral regurgitation and likelihood of success. Now, you can do these measurements manually. They're very easy. But if you have 3D echo in your echo lab, then you can also take a look at things like this. So this is a 3D echo package which quantifies the mitral valve leaflets. It will give you the lens of all the different scallops. It'll nicely planimeter the entire valve for you. 
And then when we go and look at outside the valve, we can actually see the relationship of the aortic valve with the mitral valve and see the continuity and what's involved in that particular part of the heart. Here you can very beautifully see the mitral regurgitation in uh, 3D. And then finally, we can quantify all this and we get things like the diameter of the annulus in the different directions, what the area is, um, the different lengths of the different leaflets and the tenting height and so forth. So the, the packages have become very sophisticated, but even if you don't have 3D, the 2D information by itself is quite useful. So the four things you need to know when you're doing an echo for mitral regurgitation is one is how bad is the MR? That makes sense. I think that's a no-brainer. Number two, what's the etiology of the MR? And number three, what's the mitral valve anatomy? And that includes all of these things that I've shown here, but it really varies depending on the etiology of the MR and the particular institute that you're in. And then finally, what's the associated pathology? Not to miss, but you know, things like a dilated left ventricle, we know, for example, that if the left ventricle is dilated, especially in patients with a functional mitral regurgitation, then the chance a successful repair is very less. So we would give you that information as well. So a good echo will allow you to do, I think, uh, hopefully, of, of increase your chances of a very successful mitral valve repair. Thank you for your attention.